Caroline, do you want to start by introducing sure. yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Caroline Pugh. I am a partner at 8090 Origin. Uh, 8090 Origin is an investment partnership of 23 families. Uh, 23 families represents just over $50 billion in aggregate net worth, uh, spanning 19 different countries, 25 different industries. Uh, we have been set up as a partnership where we work with these families to deploy capital into specifically venture and tech companies. Uh, so over the last two years, we've been able to invest in 18 different companies around the world. Thank you so much, Caroline. And then Maya. Hi, everyone. I'm Maya Monell. Um, I'm the founding partner of Moda Partners. It stands for Mother Daughter. So that is um, my mother and I's uh, private venture firm. Uh, we also, I also represent two family foundations, the Monell Foundation and the Vettelson Foundation, each focused on early stage research in the uh, earth and life sciences. And I guess in my day job, because that's not my day job, <laughs> I'm also a fintech founder. I uh, founded a consumer fintech focused on improving quality of life through financial health, um, basically after seeing a gap in the space of uh, consumer fintech focusing on outcomes-based solutions for the everyday human. Um, and that is called Navit. Jeez. Uh, these people always make me feel like I'm not doing anything because you're doing <laughs> so much. And speaking of, Jenna, please. Hi, it's really wonderful to be here. I'm Jenna Nicholas. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Impact Experience, where we work with families and companies and entrepreneurs to build bridges, uh, particularly focused on unlocking capital into communities and people that have been overlooked and underestimated. So we look at equity across a number of different systems, investments, education, the environment, and healthcare. And then I also lead early stage investing for a group called One Planet VC, where we invest into seed stage companies looking at contributing towards the betterment of the world and some broader advisory work with groups like Apollo's Impact Fund. It's really wonderful to be here. Awesome. And Luke? Great. It's great to be here with such a distinguished panel. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sorensen Impact Group. As the name suggests, uh, Sorensen Impact is a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to accelerating the impact investing in environment, the ecosystem. So we do that through a, a number of ways. We have an advisory business. We have a, a private investment platform that enables um, thesis-driven fund managers to, to set up a, a fund. We have a, a foundation and then in the corpus of our, of our endowment, we have uh, uh, a large portfolio of, of mission and program related investments. That's awesome. Well, I love Sorensen. Uh, it's been great working with you for the past seven months, but uh, you know, we go back a long time actually. So really excited to be kind of coming back around. Um, but just to put like way too fine a point on it, uh, a lot of people are always really interested when we say family offices, like what does it actually mean? How much are we talking about? Um, how, how much are we talking about? You guys are sitting, some of you at the intersection of many, many family offices, um, and some of you are leading family offices or leaders among family offices yourselves. Um, how, how much are we talking about with 8090 Origin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So over the last two and a half years, we've deployed about $200 million worth of capital uh, most likely by the end of this year, about a quarter billion, and we're very confident that we can invest another quarter billion within the next 16 to 24 months. Wow. I mean, this is this lots of money. <laughs> Maya. Yeah, so on the family office front, again, I kind of steer, help steer two ships, um, both on my mother's side and my father's side. They've always kept uh, two different family offices completely separate, far before family offices was really coined a term. Um, and so combining all of that, that's about uh, 800 million. Wow. Jenna? Yeah, so through Impact Experience, a big part of our work is facilitating uh, and working with companies and families on their impact investing strategy. And so over the last seven years, we've had about $1 trillion in assets under management across the different groups that we've been working with. Wow. And Luke? I'm going to answer that, get to the heart of your question a, a little with a little bit different metric. Um, we have direct, about 70 direct investments in uh, venture and uh, and growth equity impact businesses. We're invested in about 30 uh, fund managers. And then uh, we have, of course, the, the associ association with the Sorensen Impact Center and 
uh, and then the corpus of the foundation capital in, uh, in public and, and, uh, and private investments. Yeah. Well, thank you all for taking time to, I mean, this is, this is such an impactful amount of capital that you're putting to work for impact. And it's just, um, it's just amazing. Like really just thank you for doing this work. Um, so I know everybody is really excited to get into the meat of everything, but before we do, what does impact actually mean to you guys? Like individually, in the groups that you represent or across the families that you engage with, um, what does impact mean to you? And, and maybe we can shift it up a little bit. We just yeah. keep going this way, right? <laughs> so maybe, maybe Jenna and then Maya, Caroline, Luke. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. I think it's a really important one. And actually, it was coming to places like SOCAP and other conferences over the years that one of the elements that really struck us as we were building impact experience was how do we ensure that as we're having these conversations, we're grounding this in the reality of communities that are so often overlooked and, and underestimated. So a lot of our work has been in places like Montgomery, Alabama, or southern West Virginia, or New Orleans, and uh, ensuring that as we're making these decisions around how assets are allocated, that we are looking at both the historical context of how do we get to where we are right now, particularly as it relates to you know, structural racism, but also when we look at society writ large, that we're grounding in the reality and the voices and communities um, that are so often not part of the conversation. So when I think about impact, it's really um, how do we think about bringing voices that are traditionally not always in the room uh, into the room. That's very powerful. Completely agree. Um, I think our origin story has always been around, again, pre-impact, pre-Sorensen. <laughs> um, we uh, kind of grew out of the Industrial Revolution um, through a lot of you know, really hard work and dedication towards er the earth and life sciences. That's the kind of the precipice for the two foundations. And so I've been thinking about this question, admittedly having known that Dustin was going to ask us this. Um, and I think, you know, the, the kind of founding thesis across all of the different hats and all of the different areas in which we work uh, is an improvement to quality of life. So I mentioned NAVIT is improving quality of life through financial health to see a, a kind of a barrier to entry for so many folks in that space. But I think taking it one step further, if you look at the Monell Foundation, if you look at the Vettelson Foundation, we've kind of always had a rooted um, focus on impact because they were foundation driven, right? I mean, we, the, the purpose of us was to preserve, build capital so that we could continue to support um, these budding innovations that were going to change the lives of so many people. Um, you really see that, of course, so well in those two kind of categories, right? I mean, you think about what's happening in biotech right now, for example. So that's always kind of been the, the foundational layer at the foundations on our grant making strategy. And then we've started to incorporate, okay, well, we're writing those first checks to those early researchers. How are we then taking that first check and evolving it into a go-to-market um, position, right? How are we then evolving that grant check to an to a investment strategy? And so we never really had to think about it um, from an impact-driven lens because it was basically the work that we were doing and supporting anyway, and I think we were very grateful to be in that position. Uh, and then as we started to kind of evaluate the space, knowing that, you know, we, we can't help everybody all the time, um, we started to think about how we can drive some of our own portfolios outside of the existing institutions that we are working within as a family um, to focus on things like, you know, the S of ESG, right? The focus on things like social justice. So mom and I built out MODA to really focus on empowering the economic and educational development of women and girls because that was not something we were um, as directly affecting quality of life variables in as we wanted to be. Um, so the very long-winded answer, Dustin, is we evaluate quality of life and if we're moving the needle on that dial. Beautiful. 
Um, yeah, so I think for us it's threefold. One is um, really working with the next generation. Uh, we are living in a time where $72 trillion of wealth is being transferred from baby boomers to the hands of millennials and Gen Z. So we view that as a very big responsibility, obviously, to help impact the way that capital is allocated towards the right things, also helping to be a part of that educational journey. How do we get out of our own bubbles of thinking and what we're influenced by and get exposed to new ideas and new ways of thinking about things? Uh, two is, I think, helping to uh, even the playing field in terms of who gets access to capital and resources in general. So I'm really proud to say that a lot of the companies that we have backed have female founders on their team or uh, people of color that are leading these companies and uh, senior management as well. Uh, and then also being able to be more of a flexible capital base. I think one of the greatest advantages of working with families is that uh, we can act a lot quicker and we can also uh, be a little bit more relatable to the founders themselves. And so uh, one example was there's a, a young woman named Helen Chen, who's the founder of Nomad Homes. Uh, when she first started her company, uh, no one believed in her. She was looking to create a, a real estate uh, technology platform in the Middle East. And basically, she was going into all these investor rooms. A lot of people were laughed her out of the room saying, you know, how is this young uh, woman going to disrupt this market, specifically also in the Middle East? Uh, we basically uh, helped her uh, in the beginning uh, invest in her company at a very small check earlier on. And then uh, recently, now her company is actually valued at over $300 million, and she is the leading real estate uh, tech platform in all the Middle East. And so she was looking to expand to Europe uh, basically, she needed a loan to buy this business to expand her company. Uh, she went to all these different banks, all these different channels, and again, she got turned down even after she had all the success in building out this company. Uh, so she came to us saying, I need uh, $10 million to buy this business, and we were able to give her that loan, uh, no questions asked. And so I'm really uh, proud of those types of moments where we were able to give access to people who uh, so deserve that access and that uh, type of flexible capital. Uh, and then the third piece, I think, is uh, the, the silos that we see in the family office or just investment world in general, where I see too often uh, so many people working in their own silos, not trading uh, maybe their expertise and notes with others. And I think there's another sector where it's like people do want to uh, connect with other people, but it's a question of how do you do that? And so uh, with our work at 8090 Origin, a lot of that has been like, how can we actually galvanize and bring people together? that really want to do more and are very like-minded and very values aligned. Um, and through that, hopefully we can make a bigger impact by more collaboration. Mm -hmm. Impact really means a lot of things to a lot of different people, um, but there's this kind of burgeoning trend of the intersection of inclusive investment and impact investment. It's been really exciting to see. And I know, Luke, you think a lot about this, but how does Sorensen Impact think about impact? Uh, I would say it's two things. One is that good principles work. And to give some context to that, I spent the last 20 years in uh, traditional venture capital and private equity. And I think, a, you know, one paradigm is that there is, are the market principles that work, and then there's the nonprofit world. And what I've learned is that good principles work and when you have a, a, a good and true principle, it always works. Whether you're in a, a, a just an absolute return uh, mindset or in a, in a social good mindset, the good principles work. And as a traditional finance guy, when you realize that, you recognize that there are a lot of things that you learn that you need to unlearn. And that once you do that, uh, that it that it works. <laughs> Weird how solving really big problems actually has an opportunity to generate outsized returns. <laughs> Strange. And then I think the second part of that is that implementing good principles is ultimately what brings the most satisfaction and happiness that goes well beyond an economic unit of value. That if you're if you're using good principles uh, and creating good, you're going to be happier, and that's the kind of ecosystem that we want to accelerate. Absolutely. Well, all of you represent 
groups of families or individual families, and um, you have your own individual journeys. I would, I would love to get a little bit deeper with each of you, and, and maybe, Luke, uh, maybe you're up, man. Uh, <laughs> so a lot of next generation leaders in family offices, when they come into positions where they're starting to actually establish themselves as leaders within the family office, have some interesting conversations as they relate to impact. Yours is pretty unique though. Sorensen Impact has been doing work in the impact space for a long time already. Um, as you are coming into a position of being a leader on the Sorensen Impact side of things, not, not only Sorensen Capital, which is significant in its own right, um, how, how, are you thinking about, um, how are you thinking about making your mark? And how are you thinking about your, your position in, in Sorensen? How have those conversations gone internally? Well, in general, I, I think it's best, uh, I try to think about, let me back up, uh, working in traditional finance, I thought a lot about how to make my mark. And what's a lot of fun in working in impact is now the mindset is how do we help others make their mark? Mm -hmm. And a big part of what we do is trying to return the favor of, of what was done for me, that uh, I had so many advantages coming into private equity. I, I worked hard and paid my dues, but when people would ask me, how, how do I get into private equity? Or how, do, how, how, did, how did you start this and how can I do it? And so many times I would have to give the answer it's not applicable. Um, it's, you didn't tell them about the super cool was not, student program? was not replicable uh, because of the advantages that, that I was given. And so what's, what's really fun is being able to work on solving that system where anyone who can work really hard, who pays their dues, who has uh, really innovative ideas has access to be able to um, to make their mark. Well, I'm a, I'm a beneficiary of that student program that you all set up with the Sorensen Impact Center at the University of Utah, um, which gives people the opportunity to learn how to do venture by doing venture, which is such an incredible thing. And so thank you so much. <laughs> um, but as we, as we move on and we're thinking about other families and other groups, right? Caroline, you sit at the intersection of, of so many different families that have been navigating these same conversations internally. Um, how have you sort of guided next generation leaders in having those discussions and, and what have been some of the, the sticky points of conversation that they've had to navigate with your guidance? Yeah, thank you for asking. I'll just say we're still learning. Uh, <laughs> we certainly haven't figured it all out, but um, how 8090 actually came to be was uh, me and some of my business partners, we basically realized that a lot of people in our network who were the next generation within their family offices um, were having these conversations saying that they found it to be one of their biggest pain points was working with their families to have conversations around where they wanted to invest their capital, how they wanted to work together, what their own positions would be in that context, uh, but specifically investing in things that aligned with their values and that they were personally interested in. Uh, and being able to kind of convince the rest of the stakeholders at their table, whether it's other family office uh, members, like the investment team or their parents, that those were the right things to do. And uh, I think the opportunity that I saw was how can we help be a champion for the next generation uh, to both create what that could look like, but then also make the case to the stakeholders and to their parents of having real agency within their own family office ecosystem. And so uh, lending them credibility within that conversation. And that's how we got started. Um, and I think we, um, you know, 90% of the people that we work with made their first venture investment through us, which we're really proud of. Um, and I think uh, the biggest question has always been like, how do I uh, get access and how do I really start learning uh, how to invest in certain things and so you know whether it's expanding the network into certain areas uh, that you want to invest into uh, I think we've been able to be helpful in connecting the dots there uh, but also you know taking through uh, taking an example through actually making investment I think with investing uh, everyone in this room can probably agree that it's 
uh, so much more impactful when you make your first dollar and also when you lose your first dollar. Um, you know, it's so easy to read out of a textbook and try to understand you know, what it means to invest in something, but it doesn't truly stick until there's some sort of net result that you feel, whether it's in a positive or negative way. And so I think really taking action and being action-oriented is something that we've always uh, tried to uh, enable. Uh, and then the third thing for me and, and what I'm really passionate about is uh, making sure that women feel like they have a seat at the table when it comes to their family offices. Uh, all too often we've seen that so many women for one reason or another get maybe uh, pigeonholed to philanthropy or maybe are not within the conversation at all within their family offices depending on the background of the family or the foundation or whatever the entity might be. And so uh, I found that personally very frustrating and I wanted to help uh, be a part of solving that. And so. Uh, giving a opportunity for those uh, young women to be able to be in an environment where they got to meet with peers who were navigating the same processes, but also be able to ask questions. I think, you know, so often uh, next gens were basically telling us we don't want to work with our families, uh, financial advisors who are, you know, oftentimes 60, 70 year old guys in an office just trying to sell me a product. That's not the answer for me. So I want to learn from people who are the same age as me, care about the same things, and we can really do something together. And so. Um, I think that for me has been probably the most rewarding part of the work that we've done is working with uh, young people and, and specifically women to really be able to uh, have their own voice and see at the table. Absolutely. I mean, that really resonates with me. But Jenna, I know that you have been in a similar position guiding so many other families through these conversations as well. Like, are there pieces of what Caroline just outlined that really resonate with you or are there's kind of a different take in your own experience? Well, we very much resonate with a lot of what Caroline just shared and see that a lot. And a big part of our work is sort of bringing together next gen family members with the older generation to really have this, these really real conversations of, and particularly looking at you know, where the wealth come from. What does that mean in terms of like both honoring family legacy moving forward and, uh, and what is it that like, as a family we care about and that, and being able to recognize that like sometimes those can be really difficult conversations and that, the building the the trust as it relates to the opportunities, uh, particularly around impact investing, and that sometimes it's being seen as being you know out there or like not aligned with how things have been done historically, and so um, a lot of it is even you know practicing and having the support systems of how to have those conversations and what are tactical steps to begin to whether it, be, it starts as a carve out within the broader. Uh, family assets to have some proof points that can then be scaled across the, the rest of the portfolio so that it doesn't become this overwhelming of, uh, aspect of where do we even begin, but uh, taking those baby steps in the direction that, that feels aligned with the broader approach. And I think a lot about this uh, proverb that says, when spiders unite, they can bring down a lion. Uh, and that, you know, so often it can seem like oh, well, this is so small in comparison to the scale of the problems that are out there. And the, instead of being overwhelmed by the complexity of what exists, being able to say, this is the vantage point that we have. How do we begin from this point and, uh, and take a step from there? So, uh, so very much resonate and think that there's still a lot of work to be done, but it's been really exciting to see, even in the last just 10 years, how much growth and development has taken place in this area and sort of started a lot of my work initially in China, actually working with next-gen family members in, in the context of China and kind of building US-China relations around that and just seeing now like how much more powerful and nuanced the discourse is around blended capital structures and that it not being, oh, this only fits within one aspect of our portfolio, but actually across it, all asset classes, the ability to to have impact and to and to be able to think about even within the traditional family business, like what are ways to thinking about from a hiring and retention and community engagement perspective, uh, opportunities to have impact as well. It's it's hard to to even kind of fathom the scope of all of the different conversations that happen with different family members in different contexts. I mean, some organizations have uh, a next generation kind of leadership program. They say, oh get a very structured approach to bring you into the investment decision-making process and the philanthropy process and all of this. But um, I think with, with everybody here, I don't know if that there's, there is such a specific program, right? I mean, no, Maya, you've been um, kind of like the leader that brought impact investing into the fold with the family. And not to say that you weren't having impact before, grant-making, incredibly important, and all of that, right? But um, 
from the investment perspective, you've really taken a, a leadership position. Like, what were those conversations like with the family? Um, how much time do we have? <laughs> uh, it says we have 20 minutes. Yeah, no, I, I see the, the timer <laughs> ticking down. Uh, no, I mean, you know, and to be fair, I think we've been able to do it maybe not as quickly as I know Sorensen was able to achieve it on both the private and public um, side of the investment strategy. However, I do think we've been able to do, to adopt very quickly a sound structure around at least our, um, private equity venture capital um, strategy for impact. I would say, and it was also probably the easier approach to take, to be totally mm -hmm. honest with you, like obviously you have to start with the entire portfolio, and, and since we have these two very well-established multi-generation um, foundations, you have to take a different lens to liquidity. We, like, I'm not probably saying anything that anybody in this room doesn't already know. Um, and so for all of those reasons and variables, we had a very, uh, I don't think a family member is in the room. So we had a very archaic strategy towards our um, allocation and our approach. Mm. So what we started to think back towards was, okay, what, um, how have we been so successful in the last few, uh, the last few generations, right? Wh why have we been able to scale in such an impressive way? How have we become leaders in these very um, niche spaces within the earth and life sciences community? Um, First, first and foremost, and you know, I think a lot of our now impact strategy has been derived and uh, derived from and honoring in honor of um, where we were and and how we've built out the foundations because we love to be the first check in the door for early stage research projects. So why wouldn't we apply that same philosophy to our direct, you know, our early stage direct investment approach? Why wouldn't we apply the same philosophy to our emerging fund manager approach if we can? Um, so that really started to be kind of like the foundational layer of does everybody in this room feel comfortable with this? <laughs> you know, like we've done it for years, you should feel comfortable with this. Start with common ground. Start with common <laughs> ground. Uh, okay, now that we're starting with common ground, what are the things that we know? We're small, or a few different family offices as I keep saying, but we're a small team in aggregate, we're still a small team. Um, so what are the areas in which we can truly affect impact, so that we can truly affect kind of our values and entrust ourselves and our team members to go out and source deals and opportunities that um, we can not only champion internally, but that we can mention in rooms like this, right, that we can champion. Um, at a broader scale. So we started to think a bit more about direct investing first um, because again, that's, that's most similar to a grant, right? So like how do we replicate the grant approach and apply it to our impact investing strategy? Um, so we started with direct, started to find some you know, leaders in that space that we could really trust, trust with the capital, trust to understand our very unique situation because it wasn't, um, it maybe it, it wasn't a newly formed entity that had always had an allocation set aside and carved out for direct early stage venture deals, for example. Um, that then led us into, so we took a few years of learning there and then that you know started to uh, build out our appetite for say the venture space. Um, so we started to dive into then early or emerging fund managers, right? Recognizing that we wanted to be exposed to different experiences than the very homogenous experience of the board was, right? The best way to do that is to partner with a variety of different fund managers who are going to bring in deals that represent them, their communities, and the quality of life, in fact, quality of life they hope to see. Um, so that was kind of step number two, uh, and I think now step number three is us kind of chipping away at the public equities, public securities, and larger portfolio approach because again, you know, liquidity is key here. So how do we start to evaluate a broader portfolio, recognizing where we've come from, recognizing how we've scaled, recognizing how we preserve wealth for the long term, and bring um, a very prudent lens to that approach. I think it's been a really fun opportunity, and then I would say from from Moda's side of, of kind of carving out a new vehicle specifically focused on female fund managers and female founders, honestly, that um, that came to fruition because of my own experience in venture capital as a female 
in financial services trying to raise her first few rounds, people were laughing me out of the room, asking me if I knew what a P&L was, asking me, you know, what a, who wrote, who did the balance sheet? Do I know how to forecast? And I realized at that moment that, and this was just a couple of years ago, I realized that at that moment, if I was getting that feedback as an uber privileged white woman in that room, I cannot imagine what founders who don't come from my background, uh, what feedback they get and what, you know, what founders who don't look like me, what kind of feedback they get. So I think it's also easiest to lean on your, again, kind of past experiences, right? What's the past experience of the family? How can you pull on those different levers? We've got strong interest in biotech right now because one of the family members is really focused on healthcare and, all, and um, preventative healthcare metrics. So how do, we, how do we kind of give people a space in this really fun and, and exciting um, new kind of, I guess, venture approach and, and impact approach because you can find something for just about everybody on the team for them to get really excited about pretty quickly. I don't really remember the question. That question. <laughs> you, did, you did great. You okay, did great. great. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but, but Luke, I mean, you had a you had a very succinct answer earlier. I often feel like when I am on a panel and I have a very direct and to the point answer earlier, and then everyone has these beautiful, loquacious answers. I'm like, oh man, I should have mentioned like four other things. I think he's calling you out on your last. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just asking if there's anything else you would like to add? And you could say no, that's fine, about your experience and, and how you're, you're coming into a position of leadership within the Sorensen Impact Group. Uh, that's a, a great question. Um, you asked about dynamics with uh, coming into a, a family office, and I could, I could touch upon that. I'd, I really need to talk about my father, Jim Sorensen, and the most important things were not financial things. So something that my dad used to say from when I was young enough that I didn't really understand what he meant by saying it, but he, he used to say, I never want to rob my children of their accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's kind of, a I think, a good principle that's embedded into our, our family office, if, if you will, is that uh, members of the family can have self-selection. They're not uh, pressured to do anything, and they're not just given anything because that would rob them of their accomplishment. But we do want to create opportunities in which someone can, can succeed. And that, that starts inside the, the family. It really starts inside your heart and then into your family. And then you take that model then out to the rest of the world and the community that you want to create opportunities for success, not rob people of their accomplishment, but create, it a, create an ecosystem and a platform where people that otherwise might not have access to, to start a fund can do so. And a, a great example is with us here today, uh, Gina Klein of Enable Inventures who, who we're partnered with. I've, I've never met anyone who has this kind of depth and passion for the disabled that Gina does. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely differentiated. There's not a fund anywhere that's focused on this massive, massive market where 20% of the world's population is disabled. And I'm thinking, why didn't we think of this at Swanson Capital? <laughs> um, but I think uh, Gina would probably say it's difficult to get into private equity. That's the most difficult thing is getting in. And that's something that, that we can that's a solvable problem. I'm excited to see how we continue to sort of push on that problem and change the way that the system actually operates. But we're going, we're going to do questions, I promise, very quickly. Um, but right before we get into it, and we'll just do straight down the line, 
um, many people who come up and speak on stage at SOCAP all the time all of a sudden appear very inaccessible and then it's like, oh man, I don't even know what they're actually looking for here. So, so what are you looking for at SOCAP, mm -hmm. Caroline? Uh, great companies to invest in and uh, other like-minded partners, whether that's family offices, foundations, institutions who want to be a part of a cohort of really amazing people who are uh, putting their money where their mouth is and learning from each other. And you can find me on LinkedIn. Yeah. So everybody mob Caroline. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then moving on. Can Bye. I just like... Agree. Double down. Agree. Yeah, yeah. no, one. no, but um, I totally agree. <laughs> I would say something that's been really fun uh, for us to build out and exciting for us to build out is kind of these smaller ecosystems of, frankly, female investors. Um, mm -hmm. You all heard the, the shtick earlier about wanting to move more capital in the hands of more women because when you do so, we know that 90% of women reinvest their income and the capital they bring home into their communities, and that's compared to 30% of men. So if you're a female funder, female founder, please find me. Um, and also Navit's raising, so I also always have to do a plug-in. <laughs> so yes, find me after. So I'd also echo a lot of what's been said already, and just to throw out another number, you know, if we look at the $69 trillion that are invested annually, less than 2% are into women and people of color run companies and funds, so it's also a big focus um, for us. So we're looking for additional partners for our work at Impact Experience. We launched an initiative recently called Business for Climate Finance, where we're working with companies, actually many of which are family businesses, but also more broadly to decarbonize their financial supply chain. So all with a focus around climate justice and looking at 401k plans and, and broader cash deposits and how do we integrate more of a climate justice focus there. So particularly interested in engaging folks around that, but also just more broadly. So. I love that. Let's talk about yeah. that later. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. I'll just hit one uh, purpose I think that SOCAP has. In traditional finance, I'll, I'll, the best the best tools that you have, you keep proprietary. You keep them as a competitive mm -hmm. advantage. That's one of the things that uh, traditional finance can learn. It's a good principle that can be brought from impact into traditional finance. Here is at, Imp in, at SOCAP, you take the best principles, the best tools that you have, and you want to share them with everybody because you're mission driven. And the mission isn't to beat everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. It's to accomplish the mission and help other people do that. So this, this is a really special place where you can, you can get access to the best ideas and uh, partners and tools in a way that I think you can't most other places. I 100% agree. It's, it's almost like when you're trying to do really big things, you cannot do them alone. Mm -hmm. I, won't, I won't say the one line about um, going fast, go alone, <laughs> go far, go together. That's, it, it's too overdone in the impact <laughs> space. So I think we'll probably just get to questions and I will lift this like 80 pound iPad uh, and, and see what people are asking. But, I mean, one of the things that we've talked about a lot and we've touched upon it actually like a little bit throughout the conversations, um, we've talked a lot about direct private placement, which is important, absolutely, but how do you guys think about the public side and what are your thoughts regarding impact and public markets? How do you like to think about it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can share. Um, so we, should, we do quite a bit of work also on the public side. We actually have been doing a lot of work uh, looking at shifting capital from more extractive agriculture to more agroecology and and uh, regenerative agriculture, and that's been particularly focused around public equities. Uh, we work with a group, for example, called Adesina Social Capital that integrate racial, climate, and uh, gender justice into their public equity portfolio. And I think one of the really exciting aspects, given that particularly for so many families, that the significant amount of the capital is in public equities, like not having a public equity strategy, just given the current structures, is, is a really important mm. ac aspect. I also think the power of shareholder advocacy, it can be huge groups like As You Sow that really help to mm -hmm. uh, galvanize proxy voting, um, plays a really important aspect in the ecosystem. So I think it's an underutilized area that there's more to be done. I would also say it's a really great strategy to lean in on if you are a next gen, and that's, uh, again, I would assume the bulk of the portfolio is in public equities, so I imagine that it's for us, it's been a really exciting opportunity for us to really lean into 
um, those allocations understand what, you know, kind of the, the history behind some of the longer standing holdings and start to then either shift within the portfolio or do a new carve out with a new investment manager. So we've actually, um, we brought on a new uh, woman, uh, female uh, manager and advisor onto the team who helped, and she and I worked together to build out a gender portfolio for public equities. Uh, and that was super exciting. And of course now she's out performing that, that product, but that, that basket really is outperforming you know, all the other guys. <laughs> and so the rest of the family wants in on that as well, right? right. And so that can actually be a much easier approach. Um, and I think also a really great way to uh, help bring maybe the younger generation into the fold, right? They're not necessarily going to be, be able to diligence to the degree that we need from a kind of responsibility and degree of certainty on the maybe private or venture side, but they certainly can start to understand your evaluation process for the public equity strategy. And to build out those different themes or theses within that larger portfolio has been so much fun. So obviously you're not, you're not too far into this at all. You're just barely scratching the surface. <laughs> Me? <laughs> no, it sounds oh, like I thought you were looking at so Caroline. <laughs> already, absolutely, right? But you know, you gotta put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. That's, that's effectively it, right? Pre preach. <laughs> I mean, I, you just, you gotta do that. Um, and if you need to do that, then you obviously can't do it all overnight. Um, though I think Lauren Circu somewhere did, did do that for you all. <laughs> but I think it's really important to start to lean into, you know, the entire portfolio mm -hmm. across the board. And that's often when women are left out of the equation in these family settings. And yep. um, we're so often relegated to the philanthropic side of the house. And that is fundamentally doing the entire family a disjustice because, sorry for all the men in the room, we're probably going to live longer. So you're, you're effectively <laughs> setting yourself up for failure. It's true. And um, I think it's incredibly important to make yeah. sure that every next-gen stakeholder has some exposure that's an equal level of exposure across asset classes as soon as possible. I think we just recently learned that two-thirds of wealth will actually be in the hands of women by 2030. Yes, so you're really doing your office a disservice if you're not focused on the women in the group, right? Oh, yeah. I have no wealth. So. <laughs> oh, I was just looking at you. It's a global you. Shall I look at Luke instead? Yeah. <laughs> How do you think about public equities in, in the broad range of things that we do with Sorens and Impact and all of the ways that we think about impact? How does public fits in? Well, uh, public companies care about what their shareholders care about. And so share, showing as a shareholder what you care about is what's going to make public companies move. And that, that's what we need to do is show them what we care about. Well, I know we're, we're coming up on time here. We're right near the end. And there's been kind of this pernicious conception across the traditional finance space that impact is a place for concessionary returns. Um, and there are some, some organizations that really embrace the opportunity to have a blended capital structure and use that to be catalytic with their investments and, um, and the change that they wanna see in the world. Others really focus on impact as a way to sort of drive outsized returns. How, how did each of you kind of think about impact? I think we'll and, and its relation to returns and how do you balance those things? Do you feel like there's a tension there? Do you feel like it's a, an opportunity to drive more? And we're, we're really at the end, so we'll try and be like very succinct here. But Caroline, how do you think about it? Yeah, I think uh, what I keep hearing over and over again is uh, gone will be the days where it's like impact bucket and then just like investment bucket. Um, my prediction is that like in the next five to ten years, hopefully sooner than that, most family offices or most uh, institutions will be thinking about things through that lens in general, knowing that it's number one really important and needed, but also you're not sacrificing returns or all of these uh, different uh, assumptions that people have. So I think that will be the new trend, uh, but are you actually uh, putting your money where your mouth is from really a substantial perspective? Uh, and something that's really going to drive long-term impact versus just uh, short-term impact. So I think that's going to be the main question moving forward. 
Yeah, I completely agree. I think I still have overwhelming hope for the retail investor that's driving these these pressures forward, as, at least in public equities, as we just mentioned, and completely agree with Luke uh, for that reason. That if you're not if you are not solely focused on impact as a lens of measurement across your asset classes, you're probably going to lose uh, because never never before, never throughout time, have we had more access to vote by proxy to share our knowledge and understanding of the space. Oh my God, I'm looking at the time. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's really powerful that there are an increasing number of opportunities in the impact space like invested in a fund of funds, Lumen Capital, that are really looking at the intersection of both great returns as well as great impact. But then also, you know, we do work around like redistribution of wealth and like more innovative financing mm -hmm. structures that are uh, more, are more concessionary that play a really important gap within the ecosystem. And I think that we need both, right? And we need, because there's a, for all of the different challenges that the world is facing, being able to ensure that we have the right pools of capital that are aligned with the greatest needs is, um, as well as an opportunity. So excited to continue the conversation. I couldn't say it better than that. <laughs> <laughs> well said. So impact, uh, thumbs up? Uh, I, think, I, think, thumbs up. I think we're I in, think we're a right? thumbs up. I think we're thumbs up. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much for taking the time and sharing a little bit more about family offices. We're so appreciative.